Good to be back with you. Uh, I've been gone for the last few weeks on vacation and got to go out to Vernon and visit family and uh, did some landscaping this past week and it's just been great to be gone but even better to be back together and uh, it's my privilege this morning to uh, introduce you to our speaker. Jamal, why don't you come on up? Uh, this is Jamal Kambanga. Jamal works with, thanks for following my lead on going, skipping the stairs. Jamal works with Palm Ministries in Edmonton, welcoming newcomers uh, to the city, and then as well uh, works with Fresh Mana Fellowship as their pastor in town in Edmonton, and it's uh, just great to have him with us. So uh, I'm going to pray for you, Jamal, before we begin. Jesus, we thank you for uh, the way that you've been at work all among us, the ways that your kingdom's been popping up in all of our lives, the ways that, Jesus, you're just fully on display with us. We just pray uh, this morning that you would just give us ears to hear what you have to say, to give us eyes to see how you're moving, Jesus, and that as Jamal shares with us out of your word, Lord, that you would just fill him with your Holy Spirit, that you empower him uh, with the words to speak to us, and Lord, we pray that you would just speak uh, through him to us. We pray for uh, hearts that are soft before you and that you would just, uh, yeah, just transform us through your presence. So thank you that you're with us. Thank you for Jamal. Thank you for his willingness to serve us. Thank you for his church and their willingness to allow just him the time to be here with us. And so uh, we pray your blessing over them as well. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> my name is uh, Jamal from the country of Tanzania, East Africa. But I, I live in Edmonton. And um, I'm married. I have uh, three kids. Adil is six years old, and then Jalil is four years old. And then God blessed us with a baby girl just a month ago. So, <laughs> praise God. So two boys and one girl. So this morning, they were not able to come because we just came out of town yesterday. So they are very, very tired. She's tired. The kids are tired. So I decided I'll come by myself. So next time when I come back, then maybe you'll get to meet my family. And <clears throat> I came to Canada as a, as a refugee. I left home when I was 18 years old. I ran away from home when I was 18 years old as a result of um, coming to faith in Jesus Christ. I come from a Muslim family. All my people back home are all Muslims. So when I met Christ, um, I had to find a place to practice my faith. So that's why I left home when I was 18. And I came to Christ because of faithful people of God who are very active in ministry in reaching out to the Muslim people. Where I come from, my particular people, tribe, is almost 90% Muslims. And uh, the, the Christians in my area, they have a philosophy of ministry. They say, every believer, a minister. Not everybody is called in the same capacity, but each person has something to contribute to the kingdom of God. So they go and penetrate the Muslim areas. And one, they have lots of strategies on how to reach out to the Muslim people. But one of it I'll share with you that I thought was funny and uh, very interesting, very different, is um, it's difficult for them sometimes to come to the Muslim areas to talk about Jesus. So what they do is that, you know, they say they'll come to a marketplace where there are lots of people. So you have two, two Christians talking to each other about Jesus. And they'll speak loud enough for, for the Muslims to hear. So they're not necessarily talking to us. They're not saying anything to us. They're just talking about themselves. You know, who, who, who is Jesus? Oh, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Some people say he's not. What do you think? So they'll go back and forth. So you're there, Muslim, you're listening. A very interesting conversation. And that's, there are cases where you just decide to join because it sounds very interesting. So, you know, the Muslims cannot accuse the Christians 
by interfering with them because they are talking among themselves. And sometimes there are cases where good things have happened, you know. So I thought that was different, was interesting, you know. But I came to Christ because um, uh, uh, a, a Christian brother who was born a Christian reached out to me. And, um, you know, it was, very, it was a very difficult uh, friendship, but eventually he won me to Christ. I spent time with him for almost eight months, just talking back and forth, arguing, until it reached a point whereby I began to understand the mission of Jesus Christ. I began to understand why Christ was unique and not any other prophet. And that's how I became a believer. So when I became a believer, my father, my people, everybody knew about it. It was ugly. I was given three days. And if I was not going to um, go back to Islam, then there was a, a death sentence. So. I have a brother who told me the plan, what they were planning to do, and uh, I still wanted Jesus Christ versus my people, and I decided, you know, I don't understand everything about Christianity. It's so confusing, but little truth is still truth. Might no little, but it's still truth, and the Holy Spirit was able to use that to bring me to faith in Jesus Christ. And I, 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 I left my country when I was 18. I moved to the country of Kenya. I lived there for many, many years, and then I came to Canada as, as, a, as a refugee. So praise God, God has given me a family, people of God, and when I look back, I say, I am so glad I made that decision. No regrets. Jesus is real. He's the truth, the way of life. Without Jesus, he says he's the truth, the way, the truth, and life. He's the way. There's no going anywhere. Without Jesus Christ, you'll never know anything about God. Without Jesus Christ, you'll never experience true life that the way God meant it. So my passion is to reach out because what Christ has done for me, I want to share with my friends. I want to tell my Muslim people what Christ has done for me. I look at them, they're my brothers, my sisters. I understand their frustration. I understand where they are. It's important for me to obey God to reach out to them. So locally here, my main ministry is to reach out to the Muslim people. And I work with Palm Ministries. And in the city, what I do is uh, I drive a half-ton truck. I pick up furniture from all over Edmonton, from people who have things they don't use. I pick up them up, then I distribute them to, to immigrants. A lot of immigrants come, they have needs. But the whole point is, is to get to know them. And one thing I've learned is that since I've worked in Edmonton for the last 10 years, I have met so many Muslim friends, families, and there's just another world out there beyond the church walls. Some, that some, it's a known world, but it's real, it's out there. I've seen good things happen. I've seen people come to Christ here in Edmonton, and that's my passion. And uh, <clears throat> I chose today Matthew 28, it's a passage that most of us are familiar with, but I believe that God wants us to remind us something that sometimes we forget. You know, we know the passage very well, but God wants us to remind us of some important truths sometimes we forget. So I'm going to read the passage, but before I do that, I'll pray, and then I'll read the passage. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for your word. Your word is powerful. Your word rebukes us. It reminds us. Your word is guide us, guides us. And today, we pray that, Lord, you speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus begins by saying, this is Matthew 28, verse 16 to 20. He says, verse 18, Then he came to him and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. In our culture today, we have lost the sense of authority. You know, authority does not mean anything in our culture today. I hear this all the time. Who are you to tell me what to do? That's our culture today. We criticize, we question, we just don't want to follow. 
because of our understanding of authority. And that affects us because, because authority does not mean anything. We also don't understand the authority of Jesus Christ. And before he actually sends the disciples to go, he declares himself as a man of authority. And he says, all authority in heaven, on earth, belongs to me. Therefore, go make disciples. This is interesting because, <coughs> sorry, where I come from, authority is very important. And when a man of authority speaks, where I come from, you don't ask a question, you don't challenge, you just do it. When he says, do this because of the authority, no questions. That's where I come from. And I believe this passage too was written in a Middle Eastern culture where people understood authority in that sense, where when a man of authority speaks, you don't argue, no discussion, you just do it. And now Jesus Christ is saying, he has all authority. Thank you. And he's speaking to the disciples. I remember my father, he was the authority figure. And he didn't sometimes have to say anything. Just the look. he just come and just give you a look. And you know. If there are things that were supposed to, you're supposed to do and you didn't do, you better do them before he opens his mouth. That's how powerful it was. Which means that if we are to understand that Jesus Christ is one who has authority, Jesus Christ is not begging the disciples to go and make disciples. He was not asking for a favor. Sometimes we forget. We think that it's a favor that Christ is asking us to do as we go out and reach out to other people. So which means that when it comes to missions, we don't do missions out of convenience because it's convenient. Because it, it you know, it feels, you know, it, it, because we feel like, I used to think like that. I feel like doing ministry. I feel like doing this. But when it comes to missions, that's not the case because Jesus Christ has declared he is a man of authority and he's asking us to obey him. So every time I reach out to the, I, I reach out to the Muslim people, I know I must do it. I must obey. And I'm reminded by the words of the Apostle Paul when he says, woe, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because to him, it was a matter of obedience. I'm not here this morning to change the English language, but there's a word that sometimes I don't like it because it carries a negative theology. I'm not saying we should change the word. Let's keep on using. You, let's continue to use it. But sometimes I don't like it. You hear the word volunteer. And I looked at it up. This is what it means. A person who is voluntary offers himself for service. You are voluntary offering yourself for service, which is good. A, pass, a person whose actions are not founded by, on any legal obligation to act. Okay. A person who intrudes in a matter that does not concern him or her as a person who pays the debt of another where he's not legally or morally bound to do so. So when I see myself as a volunteer, sometimes I think I'm coming to help God. Jesus, what can I do for you? I have some extra time to come and do something for you. As if God is looking for my help. I had to change that way of thinking. I am coming to him because he is 
a man of authority, one who has authority. And I'm coming there to obey him. Not because I feel like it's good to, a good thing to do. So sometimes when I meet people at my church, I have to remind them again and again, brothers and sisters, we must obey Jesus. We must obey God. It's good to volunteer. But as long as our understanding is, we are here to obey. We have no choice. So when it comes to ministry, my brothers and sisters, it must be done if we are to understand the authority of Jesus Christ in that sense. Then he says, verse 19, Therefore, go, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. So first he, he begins by saying, go, make disciples. First, I used to think, Making disciples is like, you know, when we have a church, we have a discipleship class, you know, where, you know, people come and there's a big writing discipleship, as you know. But I find that, you know, discipleship actually happens as we go. It does happen in the church context where we have a class, but it goes beyond having, being in a class. I do prison ministry as well. When we go to the fort and the Riemann Center, we disciple the people. That's what Christ is asking. We go, not just to preach, but make disciples. We teach them what Christ has done for us. So it goes beyond the church walls, out there, making disciples. Now, how did Jesus Christ make disciples? For Jesus Christ, making disciples was a searching mission. It was not a waiting mission. It was a searching mission. The Bible says, He came to seek and save that which was lost. He actually went. I became a believer because these guys, they left their comfort zone. They actually went to the Muslim areas, dangerous places, to talk about Christ. And for Jesus, it was a searching mission. Searching mission means that we don't wait for people to come. Sometimes we forget. In my church, sometimes I remind them, I say, you know what, brothers and sisters, we can't just wait for people to come. Sometimes we think that they will come. They don't. When I drive across Edmondson, I met all these Muslim families. I've met people... The last place to go is church. They'll never come to church. And if we don't go where they are, trust me, man, you will never see them all your life. It's a searching mission. So the temptation is for the church, we have wonderful programs and good things, and we tell the world, come to us. Come and see what God is doing to us. But for Christ, it was searching. God wants us to go and look for people. You know, there's this talk. We say, you know, you hear these days, so the people from Syria are coming. So in a sense, it's good news because the Syrians are coming to North America. And the mission field is coming to us. So there's a sense where, you know, the churches are kind of, you know, say, wow, this is a great opportunity. Yes, they are coming, but it doesn't mean that we stop searching for them. Because I just met a Syrian man, came through our center, and then I asked him, I said, you came from Syria, so what were you looking for as we were coming to Canada? He said, you know, when I was in, in Syria, I had about West Edmonton Mall. And I can't wait to go to West Edmonton Mall, I had the biggest mall in Canada. So, then I was thinking, so, Mission Field is coming to Canada, but they're not coming to your church. They're not coming to join your small group. They're not coming to your Alpha program. They're just coming to Canada as a country. So, which means that we still need to go and search for them. 
and invite them and tell them what Christ has done for us. We still need to search for them. Yes, they are coming, but they are coming to us at Minton Mall. <laughs> so Jesus came to seek and search that which was lost. Then he says, make disciples of all nations. This one is an interesting one because Christ is saying, as you go, no one shall be excluded. Will they, will they all come to Christ? No. Because the gospel serves two purposes. You believe you have eternal life. You don't believe you are condemned. So as a preacher, when I'm presenting the gospel, I know I've accomplished something. Most of my Muslim friends don't believe. But you know what? It's not a failure because the gospel says that he who believes has life. He who does not believe, God is going to use that to condemn them. Okay, I brought the gospel to you. Why didn't you believe in me? That's going to condemn them. So I don't look for conversions. How many people came to Christ? Then I feel I'm so successful. I'm successful either ways because I am obeying God. I am doing it. They believe they have life. They don't believe it's beyond me. All nations, Genesis 12 says, The Lord said to Abraham, Leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I'll show you. I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. You will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I'll curse. All the people of the earth will be blessed through you. One thing I've learned is God calls individuals for the purpose of blessing many nations. Many. He calls Abraham one person. But in mind, he's saying, the people of the nations will be blessed. So I'm calling you as an individual, but what I have in mind, everybody. And God has called us as a church. The calling does not end here. He's calling us so that people of the nations can be blessed. That's how special you and I are this morning. The calling goes beyond. Calls even individuals for the purpose of blessing many. That's why Jesus Christ one time he said, you are the salt of the earth. He never said you are the salt for yourselves. Of the earth. Which means that the earth will be blessed because of you. He said, you are the light of the world. He never said, you are the light for yourselves. Shine that light among yourselves and feel good. The light of the world. So which means that nobody should be excluded. Everybody. Then, of course, to baptize them. Making disciples is the what, and baptizing and teaching at the how. So we make disciples. We baptize them. When they come to faith, they can identify with Jesus Christ. You know, we baptize them when they make that confession. It's, trust me, it's so beautiful to see a Muslim person come to Christ and baptize them. I mean, there's nothing satisfying like seeing people come to Christ. I go to the fort every week. I go to the Riemann Center with a group of people. And trust me, man, at the end of the week, I'm just so happy to see my First Nation brothers coming to Christ, forsaking their native spirituality, idolatry, and coming to know Christ. I see people from Africa, I see people from the Middle East, I see Muslims coming to Christ. Trust me, it's always a joy. And when we baptize them, I say, God is good. And then, <coughs> he says, teach them to obey everything that I've commanded. 
Now, as a pastor, see, teaching them everything that has commanded, that's what we do. So we go, tell them about Christ, teach them about Christ, what Christ has commanded. How long does it take people to obey God? Trust me, man, it takes a long time. Christ is calling us for a long-time commitment to invest in the lives of other people. Sometimes we forget that. Our culture today is about us. It's about me. Me, 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 myself. But here, I've taught people since I came here for the last 10 years, and I'm still teaching them. I don't know. Sometimes I say, okay, God, when are they going... Is they going to reach a point where they're not actually obeying you? It just seems some, some of you are hitting a wall. It takes a long time. So when Christ was saying, go make disciples, teach people, he was asking for a long-time commitment. He wasn't asking for a casual commitment to the things of God. It's a lifetime commitment. So that they can know Christ. Then finally he says... He says, <coughs> excuse me, verse 20b says, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So which means that Christ is saying, I am with you. You can count on me. You are not alone. And you have heard this before. We can count on Jesus Christ. In every step you take, he will be with you. In every decision you make in your life, you can count on Jesus Christ. Every trials you go through as you do ministry, you can count on Jesus Christ. When you have, when you don't have, you can count on Jesus Christ. When you have plenty, you can count on Jesus Christ. When you are abused because of the gospel, when you are rejected, you can count on Jesus Christ being with you. When you are sick, when you are facing death, you can count on him. He'll never leave us alone. And that's what keeps us going. I tell you, I've come across situations, ugly situations. People say, well, Canada is a safe country, it's a good country. It's not like those countries, there's persecution. Trust me, man, as we go out here, I've made ugly situations. But Christ is saying, you can count on me. And whatever strategy you use, the people back at home, they decide to talk among themselves to reach out to the Muslim people so loud to reach out to the people. It has strategy. Christ will be with you. And in this church here, whatever strategy works for you, God is going to bless it and he's, and he's with you. See, I'm always with you. <coughs> and this is encouraging, very, very encouraging. So I don't know about you tonight, that, I mean this, this afternoon, I don't know. Jesus Christ is calling us to obey. And I believe that we need to to be reminded of this important truth. We sometimes we forget this important truth about reaching out to other people. Forgetting is something that we do all the time. We forget. And that's why when we do communion, you know, we, they, they say that do this in remembrance of me. So we need to, re, to, be, to, to remember, remember these things. So I don't know what your situation is, but God has called some of you. And the field is so big. We think of um, ministry, missions overseas. But here in Canada, the field is so big. You can never lack anything to do. Jesus said, the problem is not the harvest. It's so big. There's just so much a person can do. 
It's the, that the workers are few. It's sometimes we forget this important truth about Christ and the nature of the Great Commission. So I want to close with this beautiful story, something that happened in Edmonton, just to encourage us what God is doing. And then we'll pray. A couple of years, um, we met a, a Muslim family in Edmonton. Like I said, what I do is that, you know, I, I pick up furniture from good people who donate things and give them to, to, to immigrants. So this family, it's a Muslim family, they just came into town. And uh, they had nothing in the house. The house was empty. You walk into this house, sometimes you feel like crying because you are in Canada and you're walking in a house that has nothing. People are sleeping in the carpet. And then you're thinking, is this Canada or what is this? So we walk in this house, empty, nothing in the house. Then we said, okay, what do you need? So we call up our friends, we pick up things here and there, take this family. One of the things is it was a big couch. And the, the, the couch was so big, and uh, you know, it was so hard even to take it down the basement because you know, it was just so narrow. So this Muslim guy is sitting there, he's just thinking, okay, these are Christians bringing this couch, they are so loving, and they're so passionate about helping me. He just didn't understand what was going on. So we give him the couch, and then after that, nothing happened. Never saw the guy for two years. And actually, he moved out of Edmonton. He went to Vancouver. Never heard of him. And when he was in Vancouver, he got really, really, very sick. Very, very sick. And uh, his wife was younger, decided to leave him because he has a husband, very sick, still young, decided to leave. So the man became so depressed. He moved out of Vancouver. He went to, 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 to um, move to Calgary. So when he was in Calgary, he was in the hospital. And now he was just thinking about his life. What do I do with my life? He was lost, confused, depressed, wife gone, everything lost, just by himself, sick. Then he remembered. When I was in Edmonton, I met some people that brought a couch in my place. They had, those guys were different. So out of nowhere, after two years, we get a phone call from Calgary. And this man is Ahmed. He actually calls from, from Calgary. And he says, my life is over. I'm at the point of life. I just don't know what to do. But when I was in Edmonton, you guys made a difference in my life. I don't understand. There's just something about you that is just different. Would you please come down to Calgary and just pray for me, talk to me, and just maybe you have something for me. So boom, we drive to Calgary. When we reach in Calgary, we meet this guy. The Lord has already prepared this person. His heart, the Holy Spirit convicts us. He does the work. You know, we do things, but the Holy Spirit does everything. When we went to Calgary, we pray for this Muslim guy. He gives his life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen. And he's born again. <laughs> and now as I speak, Ahmed is walking with the Lord. And there's a brother whom we work together. He lives, out of, he lives in Calgary. Took over, began to disciple Ahmed. This is one of the beautiful stories out of many that I see God working in Edmonton. A beautiful story that started with a couch. Somebody ends up giving his life to Christ, a Muslim from Somalia. So you see, we are called. We are in a mission. God has called us not to enjoy that blessing to ourselves, we need to invest in the lives of other people spiritually to see people come to Christ. We can't wait for them to come. We need to go out there. Amen? God bless. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm so grateful this morning because you are a great God. 
You have called us, Lord, here for a reason, oh God. You tell us that we are the salt of the earth. The earth will suffer if we choose to disobey you. But this afternoon, Lord, we choose to obey you. We choose to hear your voice. What you have done for us, Lord Jesus Christ, you want to do it with other people, God. And you have, I pray for this church, oh God. <coughs> whatever mission strategies they have, whatever mission programs they have, I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that God, you will increase their passion for you, oh God, so that they can build your kingdom, oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ. And for those whom you have called, given their special calling, they're still wondering, they're still <laughs> doubting, Lord Jesus Christ, I pray for them, Lord, that God, just confirm that calling. Give them a new passion in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray for the leadership of the church. I pray for everybody, Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, I thank you and pray. Amen. Thank you, Jamal. Thank you. Thanks so much for your challenging words. Thank you. Thank you. And I can tell you're, you're an Edmontonian now because you said somebody got so depressed that they'd moved to Calgary, so we can totally tell you're fully Edmontonian now. <laughs> just bless you in that. Well, uh, just a couple reminders uh, as we go. Uh, if you want someone to pray with, there's our prayer corner over in the corner, and there'll be intercessors available to pray with. Um, Today is a good day. We don't need to tear down the auditorium. And all God's people said amen. So uh, don't worry about picking up your chairs and putting them away. Uh, you can get your bluegrass tickets at the uh, info information towers at the back of the aisles. And so let's stand together. And, uh... So Stony Plain Alliance, may we hear the voice of Jesus, the man of authority, calling us to go beyond the, our, the walls of our church family and enter into the community looking for ways to share the good news of Christ and his kingdom. May we be filled with the Holy Spirit who gives us power and boldness to do so. May we be released of the pressure of that success is based on conversions and instead remember that success is based on faithfulness. And may we remember that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Christ. So therefore, let's go. And let's make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey everything he has commanded us. And may we remember his promise that surely he is with us always, even to the end of the age. Go in peace. <laughs>